work at Citadel as a database engineer. And today I'm going to be talking to you about best practices for database platform engineers. So before I get started, there's a bit of an elephant in the room that I need to address, so to speak, which is the title database platform engineer and what the heck that even means. If you've been around in the software wor world for a while, you might have seen some of these titles come and go. Things that have been around for a second, maybe like DBA and sysadmin, but of course there's always a bit of turnover and what people are hiring for these days. I know I myself get a little frustrated with it at times, and I'm sorry to say that I'm actually contributing to the problem here. Um, but if I think that is a problem or at least a minor problem, why do I still bother talking about this? And it's not, first of all, a pitch for us all to go find and replace every instance of the word DBA on our postings and then replace them with this new title. And it's also not a sort of DBAs are dead call to arms. Instead, it's just really a discussion of the changes which I have noticed an industry need during my career so far and a bit of a self-reflection on my personal career experience because I would say that I am a database platform engineer and I would say it does reflect what I have been doing so far in my career. So, so far in my career, I have worked a variety of database-ish titles across a variety of organizations which are pretty wide in range. Um, so I think it's sort of interesting fact is I've never had the same job title twice. I started out as a backend engineer then I went to being a data engineer. Then I was a software engineer, specifically of data storage. And now I'm a database engineer. And I've also done this at a variety of organizations from a smaller than 50 person startup that was pretty struggling for cash to a uh, very well financed companies of thousands and thousands of people from very well established, you know, series C and D startups, et cetera, um, to much less established companies. I've also, I've worked as the only database person to working on a team of 15 plus other database people with me. Also, I've worked at companies where the product was data and where it's the critical thing that you're providing to your customers. And also some places where it's pretty much just a retrospective on where you are. You're using mostly OLAP data for your own understanding of how your company is doing rather than selling it. What I do as something like a database platform engineer is roughly two things. First of all, efficiently managing many databases as a cohesive fleet via automation. You may have heard the phrase cattle, not pets before, maybe more than once or twice or even 10 times. Uh, and if you're not familiar though, the term refers to fleet management of servers or in this case databases. The idea that you wanna manage objects in your fleet as a cohesive group, again, cattle. When you manage cattle, um, cows, you're thinking of the entire herd. You're not thinking of taking care of every individual cow versus pets. Um, if you think of a pet, you're, and you know its name, you know its weird quirks. If it's a database, you know who provisioned it that one time three years ago, and you can message them on Slack without needing to check who that was. The second thing that I do is lever leverage specialized database knowledge to build internal managed database platforms, which other engineers use at whatever company I'm working at. Neither of these things are necessarily specific only to database platform engineers. There's also some overlap in DBA responsibility, but I would say this is a definition of what I personally do. When people, engineers specifically, ask me what I do, sometimes to put it into a sentence, what I say is, building RDS, Cloud SQL, Azure, or whatever, uh, for a current employer. What I mean by this isn't to say that I, as an individual, can build anything near the battle-hardened resilience of hundreds of engineers on all these platforms, but instead to say that the goals are quite similar. When, you're, when something like Azure Database for Postgres is building it, it's thinking of building a black box where it provides a standard set of Postgres tooling that engineers at whatever company get to spin up use safely and durably, and they don't actually, and they're entirely in charge of whatever they put in there. Their applications, um, any security they choose or not use, choose not to use, et cetera. When I do this at a certain, I, I, any employer, it's somewhat the same. My goal is to build a Postgres platform that people at whatever company I'm using can build features on. They can provision easily, they can manage without messing it up too much, and maybe they have a limited amount of access the way that these other um, providers provide us with less, with more limited access when they provision for, for us. 
If I were to compare at a broad level, I would say that both DBAs and database platform engineers share a very deep database and SQL mastery. I would say that on average, DBAs tend to have stronger sysadmin skills, but I would say that database platform engineers tend to have stronger coding skills because they're using them to build platforms and write backend engineering tooling for other people at the company. I would also say that DBAs uh, can be at any size organization. Whether a DBA is necessary is more a function of the complexity of the data problem than it is the number of employees. However, uh, with database platform engineers, I really only see them at medium or large size organizations. Some example organizations where you might see a database platform engineer could be medium to large SaaS companies. The reason that I start with medium for large is because there's simply a lower return on investment for automating or platform building if you're building for 15 people. Um, you know, a herd of cows isn't really that much of a herd if it's like 12, 15. We're really talking about larger scale here. Um, and it's simply overkill to be doing that much, you could say, over engineering if you're on a very small team. Similarly, uh, so I say SaaS companies because they're a great example of organizations that tend to have heavy data challenges even earlier in their stages, no matter how many employees there are. I also see this similarly, organizations with many, many databases, um, not 50, but getting into the hundreds. Again, with the cattle and pets analogy, um, you see what signs of I guess uh, signals of any organization that has many databases is your provisioning frequency, not just how many do you have, but how often are you making new ones. And there's also a correlation here with companies that use microservice architecture, which I'm going to put a pin in for now because we'll get back to it later in the presentation. Finally, I see database platform engineers working at orgs which heavily leverage the cloud. At first value, you might think that seems a little bit surprising because you might think it's more necessary at something where you're on-prem. Whereas you might think, well, if you said that it's, you know, for example, RDS for this company, why can't that company just use, well, RDS? But the answer to that is, again, the sort of return on investment thing. Um, whereas if you're, if you're at a company which is leveraging cloud and you're kind of building on top of existing managed services, then you have access to CLIs and things such as infra as code have a much bigger impact because not only can you use them to provision software, and um, orchestration, but also the hardware itself, which essentially escalates or accelerates any work that a database platform engineer might do, taking what might be a 300, 500 line shell script or a Python module into just a couple CLI commands. So again, some examples of this at a high level. DBA, these days I think, I see a lot of DBAs working at larger companies with very, very um, intensely tuned databases often very high traffic. Again, I'd say like the pet type potentially. Uh, financial institutions, anywhere where it's very critical to run on-prem or orchestrate your own high availability. Whereas database platform engineering, I would say often again, SaaS companies, younger companies where they're building natively on cloud and can use that to accelerate. Um, IoT or um, companies that are having very high throughput, but maybe less complexity. Um, AI, honestly, just modern, smaller companies, again, on managed services, perhaps. Now that we've got an idea of what database platform engineering is and where we might find these people like myself in the industry, I'm going to go through 10 best practices that I have found to be helpful in this role. Again, all caveated my personal opinion, just because I happen to be up here on stage. Um, in this, on these high, on these best practices, I'm going to be, I'd say, medium to high level, getting a little bit more specific as things go on. So starting out, the first thing is you need to own the database provisioning process. This may seem obvious to some of you and less obvious to others, but the more that you own the process of creating a new database or database cluster, the more you can control and understand the playground you're providing. I mean this both ideally in hardware and software, controlling what sort of instances or VMs you might be allowing um, people to use Postgres on, as well as controlling what is your basic Postgres offering. Are you putting something like a connection pooler or a um, or something like an HA proxy in, in the box with them? Or are you providing them with basic roles, databases, expectations, et cetera? Because the more consistency you have, honestly, the easier your job is. It's not only helpful for the dev, because they get to fill out form, click button, but it's actually very helpful for you, 
because it provides the groundwork for automation. When I say automation or consistency in what, what I mean is consistency in naming conventions. How are databases instances named? Um, limits on databases and schemas. What do you actually provide? Do you provide the ability to spin up a new database once you provision one? Or are they stuck with a one-to-one -one relationship between um, cluster and database? Do you provide them the ability to create new roles? And if so, what are the depth of those roles? Standard permissions, secret storage. If you're using passwords as an ingress method, where are those passwords getting stored? How, who has access to them? Is it just the people on the team? Is it you, et cetera? If you're able to put this all very consistently, imagine how much more powerful the automation that you write to do any maintenance across your hundreds of databases is gonna be. If we start out here with, again, the very high level idea of what are you doing in this life cycle of a database as a platform engineer, you might imagine, okay, well, now to spin up a database, you've got a form. I'm going to allow the user, or there's some engineer at the company building a feature to fill out some data, name, maybe some info about who they are, um, what sort of hardware they think they're need, they need, maybe select from some drop-down t-shirt sizes. And now I'm going to send it off to a worker queue, and bing, bang, boom, they now have a database after some period of time. That's all fun and dandy until we get to point two. Don't make it too easy to provision databases. The frictionless ability to provision hardware or software, usually both in this case, is very expensive. Um, also, microservice architecture. I said it was going to come back, and here it is, at least for the first time. Microservice architecture does not port particularly well to databases. Often you see one of two patterns. Either you see a lot of microservices that are all connecting to the same monolith database, and in that case, you could ask, well, what's the point of a microservice architecture if they have a single point of failure like that? And then on the other hand, you have the other possibility, which is you spin up a new database often for every single database or for every single service, resulting in many small, usually under over-provisioned, therefore over-expensive databases. If you make it too easy to provision databases, in addition to these costs, you're also simply making it very challenging for you to maintain. Um, you know, I have experienced times when you make it a little bit too easy, you get a bit too good at the automating, and you blink your eyes and suddenly, where do these 200 new databases come from, and why are so few of them actually in use? Um, so don't make it too hard on yourself. Engineers really tend to hate the idea of something like, well, okay, every time anybody needs to spin up a database, they have to talk to us. And I do think that that's good to have criticism there, but whatever it means for your team, adding some friction to this process is good whether that is some sort of approval, whether it's a 30 minute call with you, whether it's something will actually reduce the amount of databases you have to manage over time. Once you provision this database, again, adding that step to kind of do a little checkbox there, we now have to make sure that it stays healthy beyond just simply provisioning time. Because if part of the goal is that people can own their data, own the maintenance, you need to be able to kind of push them in the right direction. Some examples of things that you want users to do on a long-term basis could be archiving and deleting um, deprecated tables. It could be deleting unused or covered indexes or maintaining database metadata accuracy, information describing what this cluster is, what it's used for, et cetera. Also right-sizing right -sizing services. In general, at a very high level, there's kind of two rough ways that you can maintain this, the carrot or the stick. If you're not familiar with this, basically it means either you're incentivizing users, you're saying, if you do this, then good luck, We're, you're going to be our favorite database user, or something a little bit more harsh and top down with the stick being a bit more negative, typically. Some examples of different ways you could do this could be, for example, cost visibility. You could be showing your whole company, wow, which teams are spending what on databases? Um, are they overspending or under? You could say that's a bit of both. Um, you might feel a little bit of self-consciousness if your team happens to be number one, but also it does a secondary good job of really making engineers understand the literal cost of spinning up new services. You can also be monitoring and alerting on underutilized resources. So when that team has a table that's like a terabyte in size that hasn't been scanned for about eight, 10 months, they actually get a ping about it and they know that it either needs to be deleted, sent to cold storage, something else. They actually keep accountable for these things over time. Um, in both of these, you as a team essentially have the responsibility to figure out what is your pattern with maintaining this and helping engineers make the best decisions. Are you going to be more the carrot or the stick? I won't say that on, my per on a personal note, this is really up to the team. Personal note, I think I used to be very pro-carrot. 
now I'm very balanced <laughs> because sometimes I have learned the stick is a little necessary, but at the end of the day, it's good to still be able to incentivize people and not have to run after them, which is fun for nobody. Or else what? That's the stick. So now we're going to add a fourth step to this database life cycle. Now that we have our database, we don't even know how many days, months, years might be between three and four, but we want to make sure that it stays in good health without us having to be the doctor at its bedside all the time. For point four, I'm going to sort of mention back to something that I mentioned in point three, managing database metadata. Database metadata is anything that describes what's in the cluster or where to find it or anything like that. So not just name and hosts or maybe service discoverability, but also team ownership, um, contact methods. How do we automatically reach out to PagerDuty, for example, if anything goes wrong with this? And it's the middle of the night and we don't know who spun this up. We have no clue. Basically, managing database metadata wholesale hardens your systems to corporate reality and human fallibility. Oftentimes, the V1 you see of database metadata is something like in Terraform or some repo, like a flat file, and then every time the ownership changes or when you provision, you put like an email and it's a name. That is a start, and I'm not going to bash that because that's better than nothing for sure. However, like I said about corporate reality, human fallibility, when there's a reorg and maybe that team moves elsewhere or maybe that person leaves, how is that being kept up? Maybe there are engineers in this crowd who have managed to do it perfectly, but I can say at least I haven't. And so in that case, I think it's much better to have something dynamic, meaning you store this data in some sort of, well, database, because we're here talking about databases that can be accessed, updates, writes, deletes via services through things like your form. So you can keep it up to date automatically, as well as read from it in other services for discoverability. Something I'd point out here proactively is that if you do do this, you are introducing a new single point of failure in your system. So if you do decide to deploy something like a database metadata service, try to decide ahead of time, what should the implications be if this goes down? Should the implications be that maybe my observability tools can't find what exists? That's a bummer. Um, will it be that nothing can connect? That's a much bigger bummer. So I would say figure out ahead of time, what is the impact of this? In terms of actual deployment, there's a few things I recommend. First of all, obviously, high availability. Usually that's the case for almost everything. But um, I would also suggest decoupling it in some nature from other databases. Because what happens if all your, if you're trying to use this tool to observe some sort of outage and your exact metadata system is out too? That doesn't mean it can't be in Postgres. Um, Postgres is a fine tool for this. Personally, I have found document storage to also be fine. It's not very relational data. Um, however, in general, I would say keep some separation there if you can to ensure separation of concerns. So we're adding on another step here, some new code to our worker queue. And now when it's done, provisioning all those good things, secrets, hardware, software, it's also going to maybe write some sort of um, post to your database metadata system. And that, so now anything looking at it knows that you exist and how to contact it. Step five is building scoped developer-owned tooling. What I mean by this is now that you've provided your black box of software for people to spin up into and kind of reach out to Postgres to, it's nice to provide them with some tooling in the box so they can kind of manage and maintain these things. However, there's a bit of a, I would I mean, there's a bit of a line there between what is helpful and what could be potentially too heavyweight and too high level understanding to pass to people kind of willy-nilly. This is a personal opinion. My personal opinion is that some good things to enable developers to do are things like re-indexing, canceling PIDs of runaway queries, maybe a safe method of password rotation, um, not wholesale, but something that you can orchestrate for them that they can trigger, um, advanced diagnostics, et cetera. Some things that you might think twice about that are either infrequent enough or might be kind of potentially enough place where they can injure more than benefit could be really advanced parts of logical replication. For example, you don't want to give somebody a tool and they ask, well, why is my wall growing this size? And they don't really understand the concept of a logical replication slot. You want to make sure you cover their bases, and that's still your job in some ways. Um, DR, this is something that I'd recommend that you build in the box when you're providing them that basic utility, high availability, any disaster recovery, backups. Those are things that you can do really consistently rather than passing it off to the user. Um, unlimited config selection. 
Often I think it's best to work in t-shirt sizes so that they have kind of paired groups of configuration that you might be able to pre-select for them or give them a little bit of steps along the way, even if they get to make the final decision. Some other tooling which you can build, which I think is very helpful, are things like migration safety linters. And even anything as basic as saying, are they using concurrently? Um, what version is this? Is it going to lock this based on this version? Are all really good things you can do to help avoid downtime that you know that you can hopefully help them escalate their development process rather than needing to stop them manually all the time. So adding on one more step, basically just more long-term health and maintenance. Point six is solving for fleet-wide change rollout. There's a lot of things you need to do to maintain a fleet of databases, no matter what the platform is, whether it be on Kubernetes, um, on a Docker container, on-prem, on a managed service, et cetera. And you need to be able to do things like OS upgrades, architecture changes, standard role or function introduction. Maybe you deploy, for example, a Datadog user across every single database so that Datadog can utilize it for stats. But maybe you need to update the permissions, or maybe you need to delete it and replace it with some other monitoring thing that you decide to use. Maybe you need to rotate certs on a regular basis, or even just change a regular config. These are things that you need to figure out how are you going to do them both individually to a single database, but also for things that are more fleet-wide, like OS upgrades, how can you do them in bulk? One thing that I would say I found that even managed services are still working on getting better at is a fleet-wide view. I think when you look at a lot of managed service, services today, even they haven't solved it completely in totality because a lot of the time they assume that you're kind of dealing with one at a time. They do still sort of assume pets rather than a sort of fleet-wide, broad action triggering view. So this is something that is often still left on either the CLI level or the human process level. Solving these things personally, um, one back one, solving these things personally is you can decide how you orchestrate it. Personally, I'm a fan of infrastructure as code. Um, I like Terraform for a lot of these things as much as you can do with it. Um, but being able to solve these will prevent and also orchestrate it with your, um, with your database metadata service will enable you to sort of do these things automatically. Imagine a system where you can reach out, say what exists, where do I reach it, and how am I going to be doing these actions across my fleet? Point seven is connecting via static A record or C name for clients. When you are spinning up your servers, what are you going to give to your clients? How are they connecting? The best answer to this is something like um, is something like an internal record that stays static so that whenever you change anything under the hood, they don't actually have to coordinate with you. So instead of giving them the raw IP of the VM or even the raw name of, for example, like an Azure SQL instance, give them some sort of give them some sort of a record in your own system so that you can change things under the hood and do infra-level cutovers without them being aware. Common example, which I've personally done at this point many times, and which I imagine a lot of other people in this room have also done, is doing upgrades or server changes via logical replication. So if you're doing an upgrade from Postgres, maybe um, you know 12 to maybe you're going to be on the cusp of 17 here, then you might want to set up a downstream database on 17, logical replication to copy your data, and maybe you take some brief downtime while you cut over and redirect that host name to be your new server and maybe some other things under the hood as well. That wouldn't be possible if you had given the client the raw IP. Instead, you would be there at the maintenance window coordinating them to, okay, roll out your pods now. And then that's just a lot less fun and gives you a lot less control as well as just leading to longer downtime overall. So there's two more, which are, I would say, very slightly spicier. Don't get too excited. I'm just trying to keep you guys awake here at the end of this lovely conference, still in my opinion. So before we get started, pop quiz. You ask a software engineer, how much downtime can your database take? What do they respond? None, of course. That's the answer everybody has. And though I do joke on it, and it's a very serious joke, I can't count how many times I've had this conversation. It's also from the place of this is their service. Maybe they don't even understand how much downtime they can take. And we've all been on the side of under promise over deliver. So that's what they're trying to do to you in that circumstance. But it does lead to a very weird situation where instead of taking short occasional downtime during some consistent window, you end up avoiding and avoiding, cut forward five years, suddenly there's an upgrade of some weird thing. And then you have some kind of two hour critical downtime when all along you could have instead just been using your maintenance windows. 
So point eight is take planned downtime regularly. What I mean by downtime is just the server being unavailable in one way, shape, or form. I don't necessarily mean a full vacuum full hour long window or something like that, but a time to restart, pick up those changes I was talking about in my last slide. Um, it's important in this process to establish your maintenance windows and expectations. What I would recommend is establishing something like a weekly maintenance window where you expect there to be completely backward compatible changes lasting some maximum amount of time. So you say to teams, hey, every Saturday at X o'clock, uh, you know, there's a possibility that right once a quarter, we're just going to do a restart. It'll be about this much maximum seconds downtime. It'll be totally backward compatible. You don't have to deal with anything. If you're nice or if they want to, maybe they can even schedule a brief pager duty window around it or something like that. Um, this enables engineers on your team to schedule tasks in those windows. And it also enables you to be more communicative of when you need coordination, because there are some things that probably shouldn't be in that window, like major version upgrades, which of course might actually have non-backward and non-backward compatible changes and longer downtime that you probably should coordinate with the clients. Seeking leadership buy-in is also very much to your advantage. By seeking leadership buy-in, I mean get the overall organization on your side in regards to why this is important, why you do actually maybe need a scheduled longer time for your major version upgrade. If you're doing these major version upgrades or longer downtime, measuring the server level downtime will also be very helpful and announcing it publicly. So one thing that I've seen consistently is you coordinate with a team. You say, OK, we're doing a major version upgrade. Um, on average, these take, if you're using logical replication, maybe you want to say a couple seconds, in my experience, down to a couple minutes if you're doing PG upgrade or maybe even longer in different circumstances. And then they, and the client says, OK, grumble, grumble, it's a bummer, but here's the time you can do it. And then you do it. And they say, well, you said it was five minutes, and it was actually took 15 whole minutes. And then you look and check the log, and you see, well, Actually, it looks like the services had a hard time dealing with the fact that the databases were down, and then the spin-up process took an extra X seconds or minutes. So being able to kind of cover your, cover your, cover your path a little bit and understand what is your part, what, what, what is the server downtime, and what is the client side downtime? Because the harsh reality is that, in my experience, a lot of clients just are built to assume the database is always there and aren't that great at recovering when it might be unavailable even for a second or two. So being able to understand what is your downtime and what is app downtime is also very helpful here. Number nine, prioritize observability over latency. This is a fun one, in my opinion. <laughs> but why I would say this is that when you're building a platform, you want to build to be able to understand what's going on in this platform. And you want to build so that when you don't understand what's going on and you get paged, you can actually debug it. Postgres, by default, um, generally makes the choice to be simple but extensible. So it provides a lot in the box that you could choose to turn on, but doesn't turn it on for you. This applies to a lot of things. Configurations tend to be a bit more on the conservative side, I would say, or make kind of like the worst case scenario assumption about your hardware. But also with latency, I mean, also with observability, there's a lot of tooling that almost everybody turns on, like pgstat statements, that isn't actually on by default. In this case, I basically suggest turn it on. There is a maximum, which I'll go through some specifics in the next slide. But when you turn these on, the reason they're off by default is that essentially it just means you're writing more to disk, which then in turn uses more CPU and IO, which is why they would choose to keep it off by default, because there is some amount of hit to um, some amount of hit to your to your throughput based on the IO. However, usually I have found this personally to not be that much of a problem, especially if you're running on modern disks. It tends to be, it's more of a function of what disks are using than what Postgres version are using. So even if you're using an old Postgres version, if you're on some really advanced hardware, the impact is quite minimal. Another reason is we're going back again for the third time to microservices. You might be able to tell I have some opinions about them. Um, microservices are basically app level database sharding. It's saying if you have one database per microservice, you're basically saying, I'm going to shard these tables into this database because they happen to just be for this application. And in that case, your databases tend to just be smaller. You don't often get to this big monolith where maybe that little bit of extra CPU is really what you need to keep alive when suddenly you're spiking and your burst is going crazy. 
if you're already sharded, essentially, then often you find these databases actually have a good amount of overhead, as well as being more complex. Again, not only if you've increased the number of databases that you might not be that familiar with, but they're also just smaller, a little bit more relaxed. They're hanging out with some extra CPU there. So overall, choose when to turn off rather than turning on. Specifically, I'd recommend turning on PGStat statements, which is a base level. But also, in more advanced versions of Postgres, there's a bunch of logging configurations, which I'd recommend you turn on. Log connections and disconnections is good if you're using a pooler. It might be a little too noisy in the case that you're not. Um, but you can also do things like locking weights or deadlock timeout. You can also log replication commands. They've been adding them really consistently almost across almost every major version lately because there's been a ton of open source work on logical replication and logging in general, and these have kind of come hand in hand. Auto-explain, I would also recommend turning on. If you're not familiar with auto-explain, auto-explain is a Postgres contrib module, which means it's an extension, but it's basically already provided in the box, the same as pgstat statements. So you don't need to actually change the image for it to be there, but it is off and you have to run create extension in order to kind of turn it on. When auto-explain is on, any query plan that runs longer than X seconds will be logged with the full plan. So for example, let's say that I set a default of a pretty high level across my fleet. Like I said, it's like five, 10 seconds. And I say, well, by default, any database across my fleet of hundreds of database that runs a query over five seconds, I'm going to log the explain analyze plan. That is very, very helpful because that means that you can react, that you can proactively understand what sort of plans are going wrong on your database. You can even write metrics and graphs that show you, oh, I can see that grouping these logs together this plan stopped and this plan started, both of which are things I've personally done and found extremely useful. I would also recommend you turn long on log analyze and buffers. These aren't doing any extra CPU work. They're just writing more to every log because you're including that information per log. If you do turn it on, if you're starting with a full fleet, I would say start pretty high and just toggle it down little by little till you find something that feels non-impactful. There will always be individual databases where they probably want this higher or lower. Like if you have an OLAP database where they're running long queries for every query, maybe it's not as necessary or higher, et cetera. There are some gotchas. If you turn auto explain on, there's not a huge point to log statement, which kind of does the same thing, except for it just logs the query over some amount of time without the plan. So it's a little less helpful. And at that point, it's sort of duplicated info. Um, I'm a fan of JSON log, log destination JSON log, um, really nice for log parsing. It's much more verbose, though, than other forms of logging. So this is one where I would say, I don't have personal experience with this, but of any of these logging settings, the log format is probably the one where I've seen the most people get tripped up or end up writing more than they intend to write. So be a little careful about this one. Maybe do something like um, make sure your log rotation is implemented by disk size, not just time, so you don't run out of disk, et cetera. And finally, the last one. Remember, even if you're building platforms, PSQL and individual direct access to your database is still a first-class citizen to whatever you're building. Automation is very important and allows you to take care of these tasks, manage across many, many databases. However, when you get paged or anybody gets paged in the middle of the night, it's not fun when your automation is broken or when your team and company may not even want you to wait that extra 10 seconds for it to run versus just shelling in and running something on PSQL. So don't write yourself out of the ability for you to be still effective as a database engineer. Break glass processes are very important. Maybe you don't want to be doing it by default anymore, but it should never leave the back pocket at the end of the day, in my opinion. In writing automation, the goal is really to enable your team to invest and spend time on interesting problems, things that you actually think are cool, which to me, I don't know about you, isn't necessarily OS upgrades or altering every Datadog user across 400 databases. So if you think of it this way, remember that being database platform, being a database platform engineering can allow you to work on the things that actually sound like fun. So thank you so much. My name is Chelsea, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, we're, we're shouting. Very exciting. Shout? Not working. Right. <laughs> uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I want to ask you about 
choose like before the end when you were talking about auto explain mm -hmm. you were yeah there's that one you suggested to start with a higher value uh to log it and then uh, go down slowly but if in your in the beginning of your talk you were saying that you are used to uh, a herd of uh instances or servers how do you manage to, to change this value in a case-by-case -case basis thank you in an, in an ideal world, the way that I would like to manage it is through infrastructure as code. So imagine if you are using something like Terraform, then you might be able to um, configure different parameters and change a default across your fleet all at once. So in an ideal scenario with infra as code, you can define um, you can define Postgres parameter defaults and then override them on a per node basis if you need to. So that's the ideal. Um, if you don't have access to something like infrastructure as code, then that's where automation comes in for maybe you need to write some sort of broad sweeping like alter or sort sort of like broad sweeping utilities for you to utilize to edit configs on many databases. Um, not ideal. That's why I recommend kind of starting with infra as code as you can. Yeah, or sure. maybe whoever has the mic back there. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, you recommend uh, allowing developers to uh, submit a form, for example, to provision something, mm. so a data, new database, right? Um, ha have you done uh, um, satisfaction surveys? Are the developers satisfied with uh, this interface of having a form? Or um, because it, to me, it seems that, or my approach is to uh, allow developers to submit some in infra as code PRs themselves that mm -hmm. uh, the platform team then would uh, reveal. So I have not personally done anything like um, like satisfaction or pulling across different teams. The reason that I have, I've actually done it both ways. Either I've said, fill out the copy, paste, submit, get push this YAML with some data or a form. In the cases where it's been a form, the value of it has been the fact that usually it needs to touch multiple repos or services. So for example, um, I worked on a team where when we provisioned your, when we provisioned a new database, we wanted the cluster information, et cetera, but we had one repo where we're maybe editing some Argo CD stuff to deploy a PG Balancer. And then we have another repo where we got Terraform and we're gonna provision your um, hardware and software. And then we have another call that we wanna make to our database metadata service. So I think that some, when you get to the point of adding a lot, you could also add it to like, you know, a CI, CD task or something like that. Um, I don't know is I guess the proper answer here. I haven't done satisfaction on it. I think that if it's really simple, like if it really is just some infra as code that can be isolated to like one, maybe two files, that sounds doable. Um, but it depends on how much interactivity you'd like to have. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, hi. Thank you uh, for the talk. I just had a question on uh, of the ten steps uh, or ten items to really focus on. If you were going to join a brand new company where this type of platform makes sense, what is, in your opinion, the first thing to really get right before moving on? Like, is it Ooh. Provisioning standardization? Is it the observability? What would be your approach, I guess? Um, I'm going to cheat and say two things. <laughs> um, the first thing is consistency in naming, um, because I think having consistency across expectations really enables the rest of it. Like if you were to jump to the end, for example, you can't really have, um, you know, you can't have uh, fleet-wide change rollout without consistency in names. And the second thing would be the database metadata service. Um, because the two things in together that I think enable most of these steps are consistent naming and consistent expectations and some form of service discoverability or like a registry of what exists. And from there, that really enables you to write the rest of the automation. So if I were starting to build something like Greenfield and I were told, okay, we're starting at zero databases, let's get to, I don't know, 100 by end of year. I think what I would start at is you know, forget all the bells and whistles of provisioning and when and how and this. And I would say, as long as we start with everything having some basic assumptions, then it'll be easier down the line when we inevitably need to make changes to it. So let's have service discoverability and consistency in naming and as much as you can, like Postgres object expectation. Question? Oh. 
I have a comment and a question. Sounds great. Uh, the company or somehow they just canceled. Oh, okay. Oh, there we go. Um, the comment is for the on the configuration page, mm. um, log checkpoints. Mm -hmm. I think that would probably be a good one to put on there. I agree totally. Okay. <laughs> and and the, the question is um when you're doing the provisioning, to what extent do you allow uh, the users to turn off the safety net? For instance, if you have it, we've had problems with users saying, well, we don't need backups for this database, so we can skip that. And then we turn out, it turns out they're storing production data on it and there's a problem. So to what extent do you force your users to have certain safety nets without any exception, no matter what they say they're going to use the database for? Honestly, I just force them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I think that there's, there's certain things that there's certain things that I think I'm kind of preaching to the choir here because I'm speaking to database people, but you are making the right decisions for them. Generally, I would say that's things like people ask, well, why do I need a connection pool or that would add extra latency? And they say, well, you're going to thank me and sorry, you can't connect right to the database. That's just a decision I'm making for you. And I would include things like backups or you know, whatever your company agrees to in terms of disaster recovery and multi-AZ stuff, I would add all that in the same bucket to that. Um, yeah. Cool, next question. Thank you for uh, thank you for the great talk again. And uh, my question is now that you have this whole big herd, uh, how do you monitor its health and maybe heal it? Hmm. So when you say like when we have this, now we've kind of built a platform and a system to manage databases, what's watching the watcher? so to speak. Um, in this case, I would say it depends on whether by a platform you're thinking like a live GUI service. In my experience, that hasn't been what I've built for. Typically, it's been in for as code as much as possible. Um, anything deployed, I'm a Kubernetes fan. So in Kubernetes, I've tried to keep to kind of most basic orchestration. So one of the answers to that is as much as you're allowing database people or like people using databases to lean on you, I try to make sure I'm leaning on other teams' expertise. So for example, the most, if I'm using Kubernetes to implement, for example, backups on a Kubernetes cron, or if I'm using it to run PG Bouncer, I want to make sure I'm doing it whatever my cloud coworker or platform coworker says is the most blessed way to run that. Because there's often a temptation on platform to be like, we're on platform, we get to run things the best way. But that actually means that you get to offload some of the maintenance work and some of that work you otherwise need to maintain on other teams. Um, I don't have any super illuminating insights to that, to be honest. It's a hard problem. I think that what I mentioned around the database metadata service, sort of keeping it a bit in isolation is good um also keeping your keeping your backdoor access in your back pocket via psql um running through circumstances what happens if this ingress method is down what if our dns service is down and then we can't access through our nice shell script that we get used to or those sort of things i think that having those backup scenarios is kind of the most you can do um would love some advice on it if anybody else has suggestions as well anybody else yeah yeah um you just mentioned the uh, connection pooler mm. uh, that you can only connect to the uh, connection pooler at your system, at your services that you build. Yes, I tie it this. Yes. Um, so, what connection pooler do you use, given that you suggest everyone to use a uh, connection pooler? Because you lose a lot of uh, performance by not being able to access all of the session state. Mm -hmm. So. With a connection pooler, I will caveat by saying that is one of those things that sometimes there are exceptions for. Um, sometimes, for example, you'll see like bespoke software that assumes a certain port or that actually can't use a connection pooler. So there are sometimes situations where I would allow direct connection to the database. Mostly my experience is in PG Bouncer. Um, I've also used PG Cat. Um, I did a POC comparing PG Cat and Odyssey and PG Bouncer or some comparisons a bit ago. Um, ended up staying on PG Bouncer, but I have positive opinions of all those projects in flight, to be honest. Um, I think this kind of comes back to, again, my personal value, which is observability over latency and consistency over latency, where if you provision and you're actually losing some milliseconds in that pooling, or if they're not able to access their whole pool, then that's a problem when you run into it. 
because most services which you deploy are probably going to be okay adding that extra millisecond in exchange for often a really huge benefit on CPU and memory side on the server. Um, and also allows you to establish consistency and client connection. If I did have a team that reached out and said, hey, we're not seeing benefit from this. We have a client side pooler, which I'll admit I'm sometimes a little bit skeptical of and is less predictable, but is still a pooler. Um, then in that case, I would say, well, let's try. Maybe we can do some A-B testing, connecting instead, and see what the implication is. But I would still try to keep them on sort of our standard set. Um, another thing here is if you're running, for example, high availability Postgres with Patroni or something else under the hood, you might actually need to force them to enter through HA proxy or something that will load balance more than just round robin anyway. So I would say most situations, it's pretty rare in my experience when you're running hundreds of databases that they're expected to connect directly to the instance. Usually that means that that might be more problematic for you down the line. Um, but you're right that sometimes you probably need to create some exceptions to that. Any other questions? Time for one more. Great. Well, thank you guys for joining. Thank you, everyone.